everybody. Uh, welcome to the March Board of Health meeting. Uh, there is official notice of the publication in the Daily Record and a copy of the Open Meetings Act is on the wall in the back of the legislative chambers. Uh, let's start with roll call. Wade? Yes. Festerson? Here. McNally? Here. Rogers? Weiss? Here. Jones? Wilkin? Here. King? Espinoza? Gray? Sensic? And Levy? All right. Got that, Leah? Um, so let's, uh, next we'll do the vote to approve the minutes of last month's meeting uh, held on Wednesday, January 17th. Okay. Second. I'm sorry, who, who, who do we have? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Wilkin? Yes. Wade? Yes. Rogers, King, Jones? Weiss? Yes. McNally? Yes. Espinoza? Festerson? Yes. Okay. All right. So for the approval of the action items, we have a couple things where it's going to strike B, C, and D. Uh, they weren't able to quite get that all finalized yet. Uh, so we just have A, E, and F to approve. Uh, F is a resolution that uh, Chris and a bunch of people have been working on really hard to uh, put together for some time. So before we uh, approve that, I'm going to go through and read the resolution. Uh, there's a lot of thought and statistics in this, so we'll kind of get through it where we can. Um, so whereas... The week of April 1st, 2024 is National Public Health Week, whereas the theme for National Public Health Week in 2024 is protecting, connecting, and thriving. We are all public health. Whereas the goal of the National Public Health Week in 2024 is to recognize the contributions of public health in improving the health of the people of the United States and achieving health equity. Whereas, as of the date of introduction of this resolution, the United States and the global community are responding to numerous emerging and re-emerging disease threats, which require support for a robust public health infrastructure and workforce. State, territorial, local, tribal health departments, healthcare workers, public health laboratories, and first responders. Diagnostic testing of new and potential disease cases and activities related to epidemiology and public health data. Complying with appropriate disease prevention recommendations. State Medicaid programs and community health centers to ensure care for vulnerable populations. Col collaboration among the federal government, state and local governments, schools, businesses, and employers to support public health measures to disease spread of uh, communicable diseases or decrease spread of communicable diseases. Uh, investments in the centers of disease control and prevention which support infectious disease outbreak preparedness and critical public health infrastructure for state and local health departments and public health laboratories and a number of comprehensive effort to ensure successful vaccination campaigns that boost access to vaccines for vulnerable populations and trust in vaccine safety and effectiveness and racial and ethnic health disparities. Oh, I'm sorry. Efforts to address racism as a public health crisis and reduce racial and ethnic health disparities in important health outcomes such as maternal mortality. Whereas from 2019 to 2021, the life expectancy at birth for the population of the United States declined 2.7 years, which is the biggest two-year decline in life expectancy since 1921 to 1923. Whereas 
many of the leading causes of death for individuals in the United States result from chronic conditions which are among the most common, costly, and preventable of all health challenges. Whereas the significant differences in the health status of individuals living in the healthiest states and those living in the least healthy states, including differences in obesity rates, the prevalence of chronic disease, and the prevalence of infectious disease. Whereas racial and ethnic minority populations in the United States continue to experience disparities in the burden of illness and death as compared with the entire population of the United States. Whereas violence is a leading cause of premature death, and it is estimated that more than seven individuals per hour die a violent death in the United States. Whereas deaths from homicides cost the economy of the United States billions of dollars, and the violence of homicides can cause social and emotional distress, community trauma, injury, disability, depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Whereas 49,449 people died by suicide in 2022, with firearms being used in over 50% of the suicides. Whereas an estimated one in seven children in the United States experienced child abuse and neglect in the past year, with 1,750 children dying of abuse and neglect in 2020. Whereas significant progress has been made in reducing the infant mortality rate in the United States to be a historic low of 5.4 infant deaths per 1,000 live births in 2021, there is still stark disparities in infant mortality by race and ethnicity, geography, and income such as the fact that black infants experience infant mortality at a rate twice of that of white infants. Whereas women die from pregnancy-related complications in the United States at a rate, a higher rate than in many other developed countries, with the rate of maternal mortality being 17.6 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2019. Whereas an estimated 60% of maternal deaths in the United States are preventable, whereas from 2017 to 20, 2019, American Indian or Alaskan Native mothers experienced maternal mortality at a rate twice of what white mothers and black mothers experienced matern maternal mater mortality rate at a rate almost three times of that of white mothers whereas there were an estimated 107,622 drug overdoses in 2021, an increase of nearly 15% from 2020. Whereas cigarette smoking is the leading cause of preventable disease and health in the United States, accounting for more than 480,000 deaths every year. Whereas the percentages of adults in the United States who smoke cigarettes has decreased from 20.9% of the population in 2005 to 11.5% of the population in 2021, whereas e-cigarettes have been the most commonly used tobacco product among youth since 2014, with 10% of the high school students reporting e-cigarette use in 2023, whereas in 2020, there were approximately 32,000 deaths in the United States due to exposure to particulate matter, 37% of which were directly related to fossil fuel burning. Whereas heat-related mortality for people over 65 years old is estimated to have increased by approx approximately 74% from 2000 to 2004 to 2017 to 2021. Whereas voting helps shape the conditions in which people can be healthy and good health is consistently positively associated with higher likelihood of voter participation, but only 53.4% of eligible adults reported voting in November 2018 election. Whereas public health organizations use National Public Health Week to educate 
public policymakers and public health professions professionals on issues that are important to improving the health of the people in the United States. Whereas studies show that small strategic investments in disease prevention can result in significant savings in healthcare costs. Whereas vaccinations is one of the most significant public health achievements in history and has resulted in a substantial decrease in the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths associated with vaccine preventable diseases and healthcare costs associated with the vaccine preventable diseases. Whereas 10% increase in local public health spending contributes to a 6.9% decrease in infant deaths and 3.2% decrease in deaths related to cardiovascular disease. And a 1.4% decrease in deaths due to diabetes and 1.4% decrease in cancer related deaths. Whereas public health professionals help communities prevent, prepare for, mitigate, and recover from the impact of a full range of health threats, including disease outbreaks such as COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, natural disasters such as wildfires, flooding, and severe storms, and other disasters including disasters caused by human activity and public health emergencies. Whereas public health professionals collaborate with partners outside of the health sector, including city planners, transportation officials, education officials, and private sector businesses, recognizing that other sectors can influence health outcomes. Whereas in communities across the United States, individuals are changing the way that they care for their health by avoiding tobacco use, eating healthier, increasing physical activity, and preventing unintentional injuries at home and in the workplace. And whereas efforts to adequately support public health and the prevention of disease and injury can continue to transform a health system focused on treating illness into a health system focused on preventing disease and injury and promoting wellness. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Health, Douglas County, Nebraska, that the board, one, supports the goals and ideals of National Public Health Week, two, recognizes the efforts of public health professionals, the federal government, states, tribes, municipalities, local communities, and individuals in preventing disease and injury, and three, recognizes the role of public health in preventing and responding to infectious disease outbreaks such as the COVID-19 pandemic, and mitigating short-term and long-term impacts of infectious disease outbreaks on the health and wellness of individuals in Douglas County and the United States and C, addressing the social and other determinants of health, including health disparities experienced by minority populations and improving the overall health of individuals and communities in Douglas County and the United States. And four, we encourage the increased efforts and resources to improve the health and in individuals in Douglas County and the United States and make Douglas County in one generation the healthiest county in the Midwest by providing greater opportunities to improve community health and prevent disease and injury and strengthening the public health system and workforce in the Douglas County and encourages the people of Douglas County to learn about the role of the public health system in improving health across Douglas County and the United States. Dated this 20th day of March, 2024. So do we wanna vote on this separate or do we want to vote on them all together? Okay, so can I get a motion to approve A, E, and F? Yeah, okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Yes, I'll vote to approve question. A, E, and F. Okay. Second. 
who seconded? Okay. All right. McNally? Yes. Rogers? Wilkin? Yes. King? Jones? Yes. Espinoza? Wiest? Yes. Wade? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, a lot of thought went into that, so. Um, all right, so next up, health director's reports. Good morning, and thank you for muscling through that really long <laughs> resolution. We appreciate it, and we appreciate the recognition of the work that public health does around the nation. Um, just a few updates for you today. Uh, first of all, I wanted to let you know that we, uh, and I think I've mentioned this a couple times, but we're getting pretty close on this, so I'm anticipating you're going to see it in the next month or two, but we've been working on uh, kind of revamping Chapter 11 of uh, the, the city code, which addresses food safety. Uh, and this has been a very, very long process involving lots of attorneys and uh, lots of back and forth with my food safety and compliance team. Um, I think it's getting there. So I, I am very hopeful that you will be seeing that soon. So I wanted to let you know that we've made a whole bunch of progress and um, that it'll probably be uh, coming to you for review in the next month or two. Speaking of food safety and compliance, uh, we were able to finish up our closing and reinstating of food establishments that were overdue on their permit fees. So all of that is complete. All of the restaurants um, that needed to be taken care of were. And so uh, we know that's an annual thing that comes around and we're happy to be through that. Uh, but now that that's done, now we've sent out our mobile food permit uh, fee invoices. So those are now out. We'll be collecting those fees uh, for those annual uh, permits. And then also pool permit fees went out March 1st. So uh, everything's kind of moving uh, in terms of uh, the, the permits and the fees that we collect. Uh, our budget also came out from uh, the county on March 1st we received essentially flat funding. So it's the same as it was last year. Typically we have a little bit of a, um, a percentage of allowance uh, that they give us to account for inflation and um, you know, changes in benefits or um, you know, changes in, in fringe, things like that. And uh, typically we get 2.5% on that. This year we only got 1.5, so we did have a small decrease in that. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we are working on the budget. We finished our what we call our nose count, so essentially enumerating all of our staff and figuring out uh, where each of them are paid from um, so that we can ensure that we are budgeting correctly for the upcoming year for our positions. And we'll work on the rest of our budget and have that in uh, well ahead of time, so we're good there. Um, we are... Uh, also getting very close on accreditation. I feel like I've been uh, talking to you about accreditation for the entire time I've been here, because I have. And we are on track to have all of our documentation submitted uh, by, I think, the end of this month, which is way earlier than we would have had to. So we had a whole year from when the application went in. We actually had till I think, November end of October, beginning of November, uh, we're hoping to have all of our documentation in by the end of this month. So that's really exciting. Uh, this is the furthest we've ever gotten in this process. So again, very exciting. The next step after we submit that is uh, the uh, Public Health Accreditation Board essentially looks at that application and the documentation that we've submitted. Uh, and then they will come out and do actually a site visit where they will come to our actual site. They'll ask us questions about uh, some of the documentation that we've included. They'll you know, look at the building itself. Uh, they'll talk to some of our staff, things like that. So that is probably coming sometime, I would guess, in the summer. Uh, and of course, we'll let you know well ahead of time when that happens. They very well may have questions for you as the board as well. So uh, we're 
just thrilled to see it have moved this far and we know we're going to get there um, and we're going to we're going to have a nice little celebration once once we have that accreditation certificate uh, and we hope you'll join us for that we're also working on uh, a few more upgrades to our building so uh, first we we currently have uh, keypads for access to certain areas of our building and Anytime we have to change the code on that, we have to call someone to come out and do that. And it costs actually kind of a lot of money to, to uh, do that process because of the number of keypads that we have. So uh, we're actually upgrading our keypads and hopefully we'll be uh, changing some of those out to FOB access. You'll remember that we just uh, worked with our neighbors in our building to uh, basically revamp our uh, security camera system, this FOB system will actually tie in with that. Um, and so it's going to be a really nice tight security system. Um, I know other, there are some other county agencies uh, that, are, that are really liking the Vercata system. And so we are working on getting that done. Um, and again, we'll, we're working with our, our neighbors in the building to accomplish that. Um, we also have a very long-standing problem of noise in our basement level. Uh, if you ever go down there, uh, especially in the morning when, when the room is full before people go out on their respective community site visits, um, it's extremely loud. You can hear on one side of, of that room what's happening on the other side. You can hear conversations. It's very distracting. Uh, and so we're working on some noise control methods down there. Um, I think we've got uh, white noise machines that we're hoping to install that will help to um, kind of muffle some of that sound so that people aren't uh, having quite as much distraction. We've also talked about putting in panels, um, noise control panels on the walls. It's a little bit difficult just the way that that room is built, uh, but we continue to explore ways to make the current building uh, more functional for our staff. Uh, we also have, as you know, several offices that are not in our building. Um, they also have security concerns, and so we are working to see what we can do in terms of our current security system um, and how we might be able to add them on, uh, even though they're, on, they're at different sites and hopefully uh, give them a little bit better security at their location. So specifically our two WIC locations are the, are the ones that, uh, that we have concerns about. So we're working on security for them as well. We're also putting in the window down on the lower level. So if you go into our, our suite down on the lower level, um, you have two secretaries there. Um, and then if our food safety and compliance inspectors need to uh, work with anybody from the public, they typically have to kind of come out and sit in the waiting room with them, which is really difficult if you have multiple people sitting uh, in the waiting room. And so we're actually putting in a, a window station down there so that uh, people are able to come sit at the window to work with the food safety and compliance officer. And it's not this you know, weird transaction that's happening out in the waiting room where other people are sitting. So uh, again, a few, a few things that we're doing around the building to uh, hopefully make it a, an easier and better place uh, to work. Not, I mean, for our employees, of course, but also uh, we want it to function efficiently for people who are coming in to uh, seek our services. And with that, I think, that's everything that we have. Oh, I do have one other, I'm so sorry. Um, the CDC, about a week or two ago, changed their isolation guidelines for COVID. Um, we are, so basically, they it, it mirrors what you would see for a lot of other respiratory or other illnesses. So uh, if, if people are feeling better for about 24 hours, their fever's gone down, um, you know, their symptoms have been improving for 24 hours. Essentially at that point, people are able to come back to wherever, according to the guidelines um, from CDC. We're still awaiting word from the um, Civil Service Commission on what that looks like for our county employees. So right now we're still 
following the old one, which is that five day isolation until we have something official from um, civil service. So we're just waiting on that. And my understanding is that should be coming forward um, very, very soon. I think they possibly already met. Uh, we just haven't seen that guidance yet. Does anyone have any questions about my updates this morning? All right. Actually, I did have one. Sure. Uh, so back on the, the first thing you're asking about or talking about the budgets that are under process, mm -hmm. do you have, is there anything in the next year's budgets uh, that would be any new proposed <laughs> fees at all coming up? Uh, or is that still all part of that? Okay. We do. Uh, we well, we are we are hoping to uh, implement some new fees. However, we really feel strongly about making sure that we're including um, the community in in that decision making. Uh, one of one of the the main ones that we're looking at is starting to uh, charge for permit fees uh, for nonprofit food establishments, essentially or uh, nonprofits that serve food. And this is something that most other municipalities actually do um, for whatever reason. I, I don't know the history, but we haven't ever charged nonprofits. Um, and I've already started conversations with uh, Nebraska Association of the Midlands um, to you know make sure that we're getting the word out and talking to any of these uh, nonprofits that might be impacted and uh, trying to understand their needs better so that we can set up that fee structure in a way that uh, serves both of us well. Okay. So that would be the main one. There, there could be others that, I'm, that aren't coming to mind right now, but that is one of the main ones. I know there had been a discussion at one point, uh, like on the uh, restaurant inspection side of things for like restaurants that have to be reinspected that, that and tie up an inspector coming to do an additional inspection that there could be a, uh, a fee for that or yeah and I'm I'm not remembering it's been a really long time since I read the rewrite to chapter 11 um, it's so been that could with be part of the chapter it could stuff. be okay. um, I, it's been with with our attorneys for a little while as they work their magic on it okay. um, it's pretty comprehensive I mean everything's like moved around and um, it'll look very different and it could be in there do you you guys know if that's in there? Oh, okay. 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 There, yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll let you, sure. we'll let you know, give you more information on it as we sure. get closer, but we're not, my, my main thing that I want people to know is, you know, we're not trying to pull the rug out up from underneath anyone and start charging them a new fee. We're really trying to give people time to prepare if, yeah. if we are going to be charging new fees. Do we have any data on the number of individuals who have received the latest COVID booster that's recommended for immunosuppressed? I probably data? might. Do we have that data? So, you want to come up, Leah? So we have actually on our dashboard um, on the vaccine side of the data dashboard, we have been working to get those numbers updated. It's There's been some nuances with it just because only 65 plus can receive that booster or is, should receive that booster at this point. So the data is starting to get up there. I'm not sure if it's finalized yet because we're working on another addition to our, da our data dashboard, but we hope to have that up and moving quickly. Leah, follow up question on that. It, so, on the booster, is it so it's for 65 years and older? Is that based on availability of the booster, or is that just because of the need for them to have it, or would it not uh, help? It's it's a and I'm I'm trying to remember the language because ACIP and CDC both put out kind of wishy washy language on whether it should may. Um, but I want to say it should, that 65 plus should receive it. So it's, uh, I think both on, they want folks to keep up to date on it so that they're uh, protected in the community, so. 
Yeah, I'll just add the reason for that is that immunity as we age typically falls off faster. So you get an immunization, you develop immunity, but your immunity just doesn't stick for as long um, as you age. And so that's one of the reasons that um, that booster is, is highly recommended for over 65. Yeah. All right. I think I'm back up here right now, so I'm just gonna go grab my other computer. Okay, um, we'll have just a little tiny bit more budget discussion here in a minute. Um, I wanted to give you all a quick legislative update. Last month when we met, uh, really everything was just kind of in hearings, so there wasn't you know, a whole lot happening uh, in terms of things advancing or going places, so um, I have a little bit more for you this month. Maybe. And Dr. Hughes, while you're pulling that up, can I just ask um, about, so the presentation from last meeting with the community health worker, which was fabulous. However, I noticed there was a comment about um, like Omaha or Nebraska or Douglas County having the best mental health. I don't remember how it was stated, but I was just wanting to make sure that we're like providing accurate information when uh, we're giving those presentations? Um, I am not sure about that statistic. I remember also wondering where the, wh basically what the source was and what the context was around that and I'm very happy to find that for you. Okay, let's see if we can make this work this time. Ah. Okay. Much better. So this is really just to help guide the conversation because there's a lot, there's a lot that's going on. Um, here we go. That'll look better for you guys, hopefully. Okay, so at this point in the, le the legislative session, there are 16 working days left. So if you'll recall, this was a short session. Uh, I believe the last day of session is April 18th. Um, now, formally, that's the last day of this session. However, depending on how budget conversations go, uh, there's quite a bit going on around uh, the governor's plans for kind of tax reform, basically, in, in Nebraska. Um, we could end up in uh, an extended session if necessary to continue those discussions, but right now uh, we're operating as though April 18th is our last day. Um, a few updates on bills that we have been watching. So LB 262, which is the REHS bill, um, that's the, uh, the bill that has been prioritized by AG. Uh, that actually changes the requirements for certification for in food inspectors. So it removes the requirement that they have the REHS certification, uh, which we have opposed, and uh, they, they're well aware of that. Um, unfortunately, I think this bill is probably going to continue to advance. Um, I think they're, they either did or they're planning to amend LB 321 to 262. 321 is, uh, I think, the cottage food bill, um, or the, I think it's the one that uh, deals with people being able to um, prepare food from home and sell that food under certain requirements. So I think that those two will likely move on, but we're continuing to watch what's happening there. Uh, LB 307 was the syringe services bill. This was introduced by Senator Hunt and it would have uh, allowed certain organizations to provide syringe services for uh, IV drug users to basically swap out dirty needles for clean needles. Um, this is a very successful uh, intervention that's utilized in multiple communities, people who uh, have access to these services 
tend to live longer. They tend to uh, get into re uh, rehabilitation services a lot faster. Uh, and, and you see people who are actually able to, to uh, stop their, their drug use uh, with these types of services available. And so we were uh, very excited initially because this actually passed um, the entire legislature. Unfortunately, it was then vetoed by the governor. Um, Senator Hunt did uh, undertake a campaign to get that veto overrided, and I think she was five votes short. So unfortunately, uh, LB 307 did not become law. Um, we would have loved to have seen that, but unfortunately that just, that just didn't happen. Uh, LB 421, this is a bill that was introduced last year. This is that DHM bill that was um, introduced by Senator Kauth. Uh, at this point, it's still out there in committee. It's not prioritized, however, and in a short session, if a bill doesn't get prioritized or amended onto something else, it's probably not going anywhere. Um, it has not been amended onto any bill at this point. We're keeping an eye on it to see if that does happen, uh, but we think that it's probably going to continue to kind of sit where it is. Can you, what's DHM? Directed health measures. So sorry, this is the bill um, that had additional language around um, what, what uh, health directors are able to issue community-wide. So puts additional um, steps in there in terms of getting approvals. Um, and Senator Kauf has been wonderful working with uh, Nebraska Association of Local Health Directors on the language for that, but again, we think it's probably not going anywhere. So uh, home visitation was something that NALID had prioritized this year and uh, LB 1124 and 1125 uh, looks like they are both funded and within the budget. So there's 900,000 for home visitation, 500,000 for nurse home visitation. Um, so there, there are multiple different models of, of home visitation that are evidence-based and can be offered not all of those are nurse home visit uh, centered. And so we have kind of two pots here, if you will. And this is being funded from the Medicaid Excess Profit Fund. Uh, this is, we're expecting that this is going to pass. Uh, we're just, it's kind of on, on hold right now because it's appropriations time and you have to wait for the bills to get, make sure that the uh, budget is approved before you can actually appropriate money to these things. So we do expect that it'll move forward. LB 1355 gives uh, some opioid funding to local health departments and other organizations. It's on select file uh, right now. There's an amendment in the works for this and um, this is one of Senator Vargas's bill, bills. Okay, the, the big fun one, LB 1412 is the mainline budget bill. So this is the big main budget bill. Um, had been advancing, really hadn't had many edits at all. Uh, yesterday there was an amendment added uh, that would have taken uh, 20 million from the healthcare cash fund. So $15 million of that cash fund currently goes to biomedical research that would have been uh, reappropriated $5 million uh, for pu from public health for each of the next two years, so double that. Um, so this would have been reappropriated over to developmental disabilities. Um, we, of course, are very sympathetic to the need for developmental disabilities work to happen. Unfortunately, uh, like if you, if you wanna break this down to uh, Douglas County, about 7% of our budget comes from um, LB 692, which would be the healthcare cash fund uh, finances. That's about 7% of our budget. So this would have been very impactful if this had actually um, gone through. Uh, all of the local health directors were able to kind of rally uh, their support and made a whole lot of phone calls yesterday Thank you to my deputy director, Justin Frederick, for helping me make those phone calls because Douglas County has a lot of senators. Uh, and we were able, um, thankfully, to uh, achieve this, this amendment being withdrawn. So we're very happy that we were able to protect um, that funding at this time. I don't think it's 
off the table necessarily in the future though. I think this will probably come up again. So uh, we, will, we will continue to talk about the importance of public health and, and what losing funding would do to us. Um, in Douglas County, of course, we are very concerned about that, um, especially because we have um, some pretty significant response assets here in our community that we need to have the capacity to respond alongside. So um, we had a big win yesterday in, in being able to um, see that amendment withdrawn. That's my down and dirty legislative update. Probably next month will be very exciting because we will have just we will just be ending session. Uh, we'll probably have a lot to talk about then. So, any questions for me at this time, other than the ones you've already asked? All right, thank you. All right, third on uh, this part of the, the agenda is a quick update on measles. Um, you know, it's, it's just, you can't have a month go by if you don't have something fun going on in public health. So I'm going to have uh, Justin Frederick come up and just give you a quick brief uh, description of what's happening in the, in, the count, or in the country and what we're doing here to prepare. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm sure you've seen that measles is uh, on the uptick across the country. Um, so far this year, we've had 58 cases of measles in 17 states. And if you look at that compared to last year, we had 58 cases all of 2023. So we're definitely uh, moving in the wrong direction with measles. Um, we take measles very serious. Uh, one case of measles is a public health emergency. And the reason for that is, is because it's a, it's a true airborne uh, infection. Uh, it can, it's more than just a, a rash and, and fever uh, that folks often think. There can actually be a lot of complications associated with measles and uh, even death. Um, so, so far what we've done at the health department is we stood up what we call our incident management team. I think you've heard us talk about this with, with both the uh, rabies response and the, the TB response that we had. But uh, it's basically pulling subject matter experts from the department all together to tackle an issue. And in this case being measles. Uh, so we've already started our pre-planning uh, in case we have a case or when we have a case. Um, and so we've developed our health alert network message already that would be sent out to all of our providers in Douglas County, notifying them of uh, potential of the case, if there's a case, uh, locations, uh, et cetera, so that if they have a patient come into their facility, their clinic, uh, they can uh, obtain that history to see if there is a potential exposure. There's also information in there about testing. Uh, we have been working with the Nebraska Public Health Lab to make sure that all of our testing recommendations are up to date as well. We've developed talking points for our information line. Uh, anytime that we have a, a public health emergency, obviously the information line is very important. Uh, we've worked on training our uh, communicable disease epidemiology staff. A lot of them have not seen a case of measles. Uh, a lot of physicians haven't seen a case of measles, so it's really important that we understand the progression of the disease so that we can assist with helping rule in, rule out a uh, potential uh, diagnosis of measles. In fact, our last case was uh, 2017. Uh, it did not result in a lot of community exposures. In 2010, we had uh, four cases of measles in, within one family that had a lot of community exposures, including the Omaha Zoo and about 10,000 people there, uh, students visiting for, from four different states, uh, Target, hy churches, all sorts of things. So it was a, a massive response. And again, we've been coordinating with the Nebraska Public Health Lab. We've had about five uh, persons under investigation, we call it. Uh, it's basically when a, a provider calls and has measles on the differential and we collect specimens uh, to test them to rule out measles and we have the individual isolate. I do want to comment that uh, measles vaccine, the MMR, is highly effective. 
uh, one dose have it has an efficacy of about 93%, two doses is 97%. So we're, we're seeing some of this uptick in measles cases in, across the United States due to uh, the lack of uh, parents immunizing their children. Um, I think that here in Nebraska, our immunization rates are still pretty high. I, they're above 90%, so that's always extremely helpful. Um, but it is recommended that uh, children six months of age or older receive MMR vaccine, especially if traveling abroad. Um, in 2000, measles was considered uh, eliminated from the United States, so it's, it's a little bit sad to see the resurgence. That's what I have for you. I just wanted to kind of update you, let you know that we're monitoring the situation closely, that we've already started work uh, so that if and when we have a case here, we're ready to move quickly in our response. Uh, just a personal note from experience, I had uh, the measles back in 1990 in that outbreak down at oh, sure. the university, mm -hmm. and it was the sickest I'd ever been had ever been yeah. still to this point in my life uh it was it was pretty bad and i think they tracked it down to uh another student that had been in the same classroom hours before i had been in that classroom yeah picked up that yep. from there yeah the the virus can actually when you cough sneeze uh you can actually you you expel that virus that can be in the air up to two hours after that person leaves that area so uh, that 1990 outbreak, uh, I wasn't around for, uh, but Carol Allensworth, you know, reminisced about that often, uh, the Creighton campus and going dorm to dorm to identify cases um, when that had started. That was also prior to CDC and ACIP recommending two doses of MMR. So, yeah. At, at what age um, do we stop getting MMR? I mean, it's right. Do you want to turn your mic on? It, but it is just two doses. Yeah. Yep. Two doses. Okay. As a, it, during childhood, and and uh, like Dr. Jones said, uh, if you're born before 1957, the assumption is that you had measles. Right. Um, so if there's a question. Um, you could also have antibody testing done. Uh, so, I can certainly, I don't remember all the way back to that, whether I had two or one, but the discussion back then was, I don't think in the 60s, uh, when I, would it, well, I guess maybe early 70s, that I wouldn't have had that, that they knew that they needed to keep that vaccine refrigerated. And it was a situation where standard procedure was that they would leave that out. So uh, the, I think the thought at that point or discussion was that uh, I had got a, a basic. And Dr. Wilkin, the, yeah. the recommendation for two doses didn't come around until after 1990 when there was a resurgence of measles in the country and we were seeing breakthrough infection uh, with folks that only had one dose. Hence the outbreak at Creighton in 1990 in the sense of college students, right? They had That's apparently only had the one dose. Per, that would have been the case, yeah. Okay. And then there was some travel for spring break and things. And uh, interesting story that I can share with you all another time is that our case, our cases in 2010 were diagnosed by uh, the index case at Creighton, who later became a physician assistant and was living next to this family. So... Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, so that gets us through the health director's reports. So uh, a couple presentations today, uh, CHI, uh, first up. Uh, so, and I think we have a handout for that.
Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the Douglas County Health Department and to the Board of Health for the opportunity to present an update on CHI Health's community benefit. My name is Ashley Carroll, and I'm the Division Director of Healthier Communities and Community Benefit. Okay, so as many of you are likely familiar, um, CHI Health is part of Common Spirit Health. Nationally, we provide care across over 145 hospitals, 24 states. We are one of the largest faith-based healthcare organizations as well, both in our region and nationally. We are one of the largest providers of Medicaid-funded health services. Our mission collectively is to improve the health of the people we serve, especially those who are vulnerable while we advance social justice for all. We are actively in the midst of the next 2024-2025 Community Health Needs Assessment Cycle. This is a collaborative process. And because I have line of sight, um, I oversee uh, 28 hospitals, uh, CHI Health hospitals in four states. I can tell you this is not the model everywhere. So I'm so appreciative of the co collaboration between our health systems and our health departments in the Omaha Metro in conducting this process um, jointly. But um, we have the community health survey out in the field today. I put a link uh, in that uh, shaded blue box on the bottom of the screen. Please encourage all residents in Douglas County, Sarpy, and Pottawatomie counties to complete that survey through the end of May. Um, and then because each of our uh, health systems are on slightly different timelines, I wanted to update you our three-year strategic plan for responding to priority community health needs will be due to present to be presented to and approved by our board in July next year. Now, I have had the great privilege of supporting this process now for three successive cycles. Um, but I wanted to approach this process and, uh, differently, um, and, and so too, uh, I'm thankful my colleagues um, shared that sentiment. One thing that was important uh, was to be responsive to persistent uh, feedback that we have heard in previous community health needs assessment cycles that residents, particularly in North and South Omaha, did not feel as though their lived experience and therefore their priorities for collective action were truly reflected in the community health needs assessment data um, and the corresponding action plans that each of our hospitals create, which is the way that we um, allocate resources, right? It informs the partnerships that we form and the programs that we implement. And so um, we are working with Creighton University Institute for Population Health, as well as several community partners to host um, listening sessions, three each in North and South Omaha in community spaces to deepen our understanding of the assets and barriers to optimal health and well-being at an individual and a neighborhood level. We're also partnering with Children's Nebraska to engage special populations who by the um, methodology of the community health survey led by PRC, which focuses on geography, right? Random sampling of households in specific zip codes. It doesn't intentionally engage um, individuals with specific identities. And so we wanted to host listening sessions to um, deepen our understanding of the experiences of folks who are experiencing homelessness, foster caregivers, refugee and immigrant populations, as well as the LGBTQ plus community. Another point I wanted to make too is that we don't see this as a discrete endpoint or a point in time, um, but we want to either leverage an existing or create a new uh, community advisory councils for the ongoing monitoring of our three-year strategic plans, right? So we don't want this to become an extractive process where we gather that data and that's where it ends, right? And community says, well, you know, what did you do with this information that I shared with you? Um, so we really want to create um, this accountability mechanism to hold us accountable to reflecting on what we heard from community um, and, and creating uh, implementation plans that, that respond to those priority needs and, and help us right, um, course correct as invariably over time our plans will, um, will change. So that's forward looking. We're in the midst right now, uh, we're just over the midway point of our current three year strategic plan. We prioritize behavioral health, health-related social needs, and violence prevention and intervention. Health equity is embedded throughout each of those priority areas. I'm gonna focus the majority of my presentation on health-related social needs as my uh, community benefit counterparts have also done, but I will highlight a, a few um, key initiatives in each of the other priority areas. 
We are one of the largest providers of behavioral health services in um, the metro as well as um, statewide. So therefore, um, we are um, positioned well to expand access to mental health services uh, along the continuum, right? From impact, inpatient psychiatric care, outpatient, community-based, and telehealth uh, mental health services. We also continue to sponsor the um, What Makes Us Mental Health Stigma Reduction Campaign in the community, led by the Wellbeing Partners. And the photo on the right uh, is from recent news coverage. Uh, we received uh, over half a million dollars in grant funding to expand our behavioral health peer support program, right? This leverages folks with lived experience with a behavioral health diagnosis. Um, the the uh, individual here is leading uh, a peer support group and um, peer support is associated both with um, increased patient satisfaction, uh, improvements in patient goal setting, and also uh, clinical provider satisfaction, right? They have an additional resource of support uh, uh, to care for their behavioral health patients. So I won't go through um, all of our health-related social need work here, but I just wanted to describe for you what can be a really amorphous category, right? There's so many uh, health-related social needs that we might um, impact, but based on our current work, this is largely how we're thinking about it. Food access, housing, resource navigation, and workforce development and economic self-sufficiency. And I'll describe those in greater detail in the forthcoming slides. Then with, it, with regard to violence prevention and intervention, we are the Metro's only 24 seven forensic nursing program for all of our hospitals and clinics. Last fiscal year, we served over 530 survivors of intimate partner violence, human trafficking and sexual assault. We are now requiring all of our staff to complete Human Trafficking 101 and Trauma-Informed Care training annually. We also developed uh, a training in partnership with UNMC College of Public Health and WCA um, for cosmetologists and tattoo artists to identify signs of human trafficking within their, within their clientele and then know how to respond appropriately. Um, that also meets the um, state cosmetology um, requirement for ongoing continuing education so they can take that, that course and get credit. Additionally, we're expanding our partnership with U-Turn. Um, we have for many years supported their community-based violence intervention work. They have also provided crisis de-escalation in our emergency departments, particularly in our level one trauma at CMC Bergen Mercy and at Emanuel Hospital. And um, the university campus uh, freestanding ED. But we're expanding on that, um, that partnership based on the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention model or Javi model, wherein patients who are admitted into our hospital who are meeting the program eligibility criteria for U-turn can be identified by the um, case management team at the hospital referred to U-turn, and then we can connect with that patient while they're in our care pending the patient, uh, uh, we obtain patient consent, right? To begin to uh, provide wraparound services and support to that patient to extricate them from the conditions that predicated um, that traumatic injury. That can include um, economic support, that can include job training services, food assistance, um, housing and even relocation services at times. Okay, so now I wanna describe some specific hospital community partnerships to address health-related social needs. By its very virtue, we cannot do this work uh, alone. So I wanna start with the foundation, as several of my colleagues before me, um, I think, have, have mentioned. In calendar year 2024, CMS requires all acute care hospitals to screen adult patients 18 years and older for those five domains of health-related social need that you see on the screen. While we, this, this is such a tremendous opportunity to, for us to deepen our understanding of our patient's social risk factors and barriers to treatment adherence and optimal um, health outcomes. So we're really excited about this. Um, accordingly, we need to build out our internal workforce for resource navigation to help patients navigate health and social care systems that are often disparate and not talking to one another. And, and just challenging to navigate. So we are expanding our clinic-based uh, community health worker program, which I'll describe in another slide. 
We've also, we're also leveraging the secure social need referral platform, Unite Us, and um, have some really great data that I wanna share with you um, that's actionable uh, at a community level. We're also investing in community capacity for resource navigation and, um, and patient advocacy and support. So we are, um, we're financing the doula pipeline program through IB Black Girl, and we're also one of the founding sponsors um, and initial, initial uh, financial contributors to the Pathways Community Hub um, through the Omaha Community Foundation that leverages community-based health workers to connect with birthing people with social risk factors for poor birth outcomes and connect them to all of the resources of support that they might need to have a healthy birth and baby. So I mentioned that Community Link program. This has actually been in existence since about 2016. The community health workers are located in our several of our primary care clinics, but they also provide virtual support to, some, to our specialty clinics. Um, so they, we have coverage across our 20 plus uh, clinics in the Omaha Metro. Last year, um, we had six community health workers. We just hired a seventh and we have plans to hire an eighth community health worker. But last fiscal year, our six community health workers supported 2,200 patients with identified social needs. The top barriers those patients were experiencing were financial hardship, uh, medical insurance insufficiency, transportation, food insecurity, and housing. Of those 2,200 patients, the community um, link advocates, as they're called, or community health workers, identified 4,400 barriers that those 2,200 patients were experiencing. So uh, most patients are experiencing more than one social need. And then they provided just under 6,000 interventions for those 2,200 patients. The types of interventions I'm describing include patient education, um, helping patients secure a community-based resource, they participate in coordinated calls, such as with DHHS for eligibility verification. Um, they can also assist a patient in completing a Medicaid, SNAP, or WIC application. And then they're also coordinating um, internal referrals to additional types of care. We have also been using the Unite Us platform um, in a limited fashion since July 2021. Primarily, our super users are those community health workers in our Community Link program. What I wanted to, to bring forward to your attention today is since that time, so just about three, coming up on three years of usage, um, and 70% of our total system referral volume to Unite Us has originated in our Douglas County sites, again, because that's where our community link program is, is located. The top reasons why we send referrals, and this is looking at data, we've sent to date about just under 1,000 referrals uh, in the Douglas County area alone in our, from our Douglas County facilities. The top reasons we send referrals to the platform are for housing and shelter, utility assistance, clothing and household goods, food assistance and income support round out the top five. Then I also pulled data from the Unite Us network overall. So that would be all referring agencies located in Douglas County over that same time period. And what you see is there is significant overlap in the top health needs, both of, from our system and all of the referring agencies in Douglas County. And I think this is really actionable data, right, to drive collective action and investment in closing those community resource gaps. That's a conversation I'm having with my community benefit colleagues as we approach our next three-year strategic plans um, and that we're elevating through the Regional Health Council as well. So within health-related social needs, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're drilling it down based on uh, current partnerships and initiatives we have in place. So food access is one of our most established uh, work, uh, portfolios. We're thinking about this along a continuum, right? Creating access points for patients to um, access additional resources. The SNAP and WIC enrollment refers to um, the work of our community link program and the community health workers that can assist patients with, those, with an identified food insecurity. We're also referring our patients to the Cura Project, which is led by Creighton University and the Financial Hope Collaborative for patients um, with a type two diabetes diagnosis and identified financial strain. Um, it's predicated on the notion, right, that if a patient is struggling to um, make their rent, 
it's exceedingly difficult, right? Um, it stands to reason they might also lack the means to lead a healthy lifestyle, to get five fr fresh fruits and vegetables a day. Um, so it's, it's predicated on the notion that we need to stabilize an individual's financial situation before we can really impact um, healthy lifestyle modification. We're also investing again in uh, community capacity, so sponsoring local farmers markets. We're investing in the Double Up Food Bucks program, um, which doubles um, SNAP recipients purchasing power of fresh fruits and vegetables, both through um, seasonal farmers markets and year-round retail sites. And then we're continuing our successful partnership with Whispering Roots to bring the farmers market to low-income uh, families with children and seniors. They actually park um, the food, uh, the farmers market um, vehicle and the um, farm stand in the parking lot of WIC clinics and senior centers. This is actually informed initially by um, data that Carrie Kernan gathered. She was surveying uh, WIC recipients and asked, you know, trying to understand why the WIC farmer's market voucher redemption rate was so low and transportation was one of the number one barriers um, WIC recipients cited. With regard to housing, again, along that continuum, um, and I'll start in reverse order, we're investing directly in the um, stock of affordable housing in our community, so providing matching dollars to Habitat for Humanity and Holy Name Housing to access uh, Department of Economic Development um, uh, housing grants. We're also uh, one of the founding organizations of the Health and Housing Coalition that brings together health systems, shelter providers, FQHCs, and other nonprofits to better on, get our arms around um, the data and, and then inform collective interventions. The idea, right, is that we share the, these um, patients who are getting admitted into the emergency department, um, these are folks who are uh, chronically homeless, medically fragile, right? They're getting admitted into the emergency department, into the hospital, discharged into shelter, and back again. And so we wanna interrupt that cycle and really get these folks um, connected into the services um, that they require. Um, one of the early achievements of that Health and Housing Coalition is the launch of the Medical Respite Pilot program in partnership with Sienna Francis and Charles Drew. And then we have a, um, a, a partnership with Together to um, connect patients who are, again, uh, either experiencing homelessness or at risk of becoming homeless and connect them into resources while they're in, their, in our care, right? So that no wrong door creating additional access points for intervention. With regard to that program, uh, we started this partnership with Together in 20, September of 2019. Since that time, we've sent over um, 600 referrals to Together. So how this operates is a patient is admitted into the hospital, a member of our care management team identifies that patient is either experiencing homelessness, which will present a barrier to, to discharge, right? Um, or they're at risk of becoming homeless. They send a referral, um, they obtain patient consent, they send a referral to Together. A Together uh, dedicated housing problem um, solver meets with that patient while they're in the hospital. And what's interesting is over this time period, they provided over 400 um, interventions, only a third of which were monetary in nature. Let me describe that for you. So um, they do have, we, we fund financial intervention. Um, that could mean paying first month's rent and deposit on an apartment for a patient, if that's what um, uh, is, is the best case scenario for that individual. We can pay back utilities in arrear to avoid uh, or to reverse a shutoff. But again, only a third of the interventions are monetary in nature, which speaks to just the need to connect disparate systems. A really illustrative example is the, um, there was a patient who qualified for voucher housing, but lacked a state issued ID. So they could have presumably had excessive length of stay in our hospital, which drives up the cost of healthcare. They were eligible for service, but no one along this, you know, this length of time had identified that the limiting factor was a state issued ID, which is a very low cost intervention to connect a patient to resources that would um, you know, stabilize their situation and improve their health. We're also investing in the healthcare workforce pipeline. We recognize even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were experiencing healthcare workforce shortage, which are only uh, projected to increase with time. 
And we recognize too, that our current healthcare workforce is not reflective of the patients in the communities that we serve. So we have intentional partnerships with several of our local high schools to um, help youth um, see themselves in a career in healthcare and provide those practical experiences uh, for them to, to help really identify where their interests in healthcare might lie. A couple of things I wanted to note here, uh, we have a, a successful partnership with Latino Center of the Midlands. Um, they host a uh, health career internship program um, in about two and a half years time now, we have um, graduated 24 unique students through that health career internship program. They come out of that program uh, with uh, certifications in Stop the Bleed, um, QPR, which is a suicide uh, intervention, suicide prevention intervention, mental health first aid, um, and CPR first aid. Uh, the next level of that internship program for certain students who said, you know what, I am interested in healthcare, we will fully fund the cost of their CNA program um, with a commitment to come work for us part-time, PRN status, and we've got um, seven students so far that have completed their CNA and that four are working in our uh, hospitals and clinics today. We have uh, another uh, example of this is the Health Career Academy through CHI Health Emanuel. They have partnerships with Ron Colley, Gross Catholic, and Benson High School. Um, we've currently got six students, um, six nursing students who are working as CNAs in our hospital and two in uh, radiology. Now, if you'll allow it, I'll provide a quick uh, community benefit financial update. So um, collectively, our Omaha Metro and Council Bluffs hospitals contributed $108 million in total community benefit this last fiscal year. That includes providing care to over 29,000 patients whose care uh, was covered in part by Medicaid, but for which Medicaid does not fully reimburse us for the cost of providing that care. That also includes an additional almost 9,000 patients who were uninsured or underinsured um, who accessed our financial assistance program. And not an insubstantial proportion of that total, um, $28.8 uh, million, or over a quarter of our total uh, community benefit was in broader community health initiatives, which I'll describe in greater detail. So this shows our community benefit in the Omaha Metro over three years. A couple of things I wanna draw your attention to. Um, we, so the largest driver, of course, is our total medical financial assistance. That's that $79 million in the first gray bar. What you do see is that there is a decline over the preceding two years. Uh, our, actually, the share of our um, payer mix, that is Medicaid, has actually increased incrementally over that three-year period. However, uh, our gross volume has declined uh, from FY22 to 23, right? So we're serving overall more Medicaid patients, but fewer patients in total. Um, we're also finding that um, our average cost of care has steadily increased over these three years and uh, length, average lengths of stay have increased. And as you all know, right, CMS dictates a certain diagnosis upon admission should um, should translate to certain number of days in the hospital. And beyond that, those certain number of days, we are not being compensated for that care. There are, um, however, uh, there has been a, um, an increase in our total um, broader community health over this time period. And a couple of things I wanna draw your attention to or, or provide um, greater uh, understanding on. So with regard to, if you're looking in the middle, um, community health improvement services, that largely entails uh, Medicaid counseling and enrollment. That includes medical financial partnership or legal aid services to our patients. Um, that includes things like the Vaccines for Kids program um, at Midlands Hospital and um, Stop the Bleed, which is mass casualty training. Um, within health profession education, we've also seen an, uh, a significant increase in that area. That's clinical rotations and preceptorships for nursing students, um, oncology, radiology, med tech, pharmacy students, that's our graduate medical education. Um, within research, I am investigating this because I don't think that this actually constitutes a significant drop in overall research activities, but perhaps under counting or under reporting of that activity, which sometimes happens when there are staff transitions. 
Within financial and in-kind contributions, you're also seeing a significant increase over that three-year time period. Um, a couple of notable drivers of that increase are increasing costs to discharge patients. Um, sometimes that is we are um, needing to purchase durable medical equipment for patients, that, and that's not covered by their insurance. Um, dialysis services uh, have steadily increased. Um, we're also, that also includes things like grants to community benefit or to community not based nonprofit organizations and sponsorships of things like the um, local farmers market and council bluffs. Finally, community building activities largely uh, a, a good example of this would be um, our sponsorship of the tobacco education and advocacy of the Midlands program. Uh, we're the fiscal sponsor and, and home of that of that program. Also, um, yeah, okay, total community benefit. So, like I said, we are it is slightly down um, from the last two years, but it, it's a two percent decrease, and again, largely attributable to volume. You can see our trend over the last five years. Um, we're actually still um, net increase uh, from FY19, um, and we've served over just about 240 Medicaid patients over that time and 101,000 patients um, who accessed our financial assistance program. Okay, I promise, I'm almost done. Um, wanted to just define for you all what health equity means to our health system, that everyone has a fair and opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This is a, not an exhaustive or comprehensive listing of all of our partnerships, but um, we feel it's incredibly important to work with those organizations in our community who are most proximal to the health issues we're trying to impact and the populations we intend to serve. So hopefully this is reflective. You can see that in the partnerships that we're making, um, that, that commitment to achieving health equity and, and uh, partnership with those who are best positioned to lead that work. In 2024, so we just awarded nine, the nine recipient organizations you see on your, uh, on this slide, a total of $437,000 um, to uh, implement or expand programming in the areas of um, access to care, behavioral health, food, housing, and violence prevention and intervention. While not explicitly um, called out in our implementation plan, I would be remiss as one of the largest providers of maternity care in the Omaha Metro um, to, um, we, we are committed to equitable maternity care. And a couple of updates that I want to share with you in this regard are, we ha our women's health service line has required um, labor delivery and NICU staff to receive implicit bias training we are offering doula care for patients with social risk factors for poor birth outcomes at our university campus mom and baby clinic as well as Emanuel's low risk birthing center. We launched the Centering Preg Pregnancy Group Prenatal Care Program at university campus at the mom and baby clinic both in English and Korean. We're a founding member of the Pathways Community Hub and helped to fundraise that uh, initial $1 million that will help serve 100 birthing people over the next two years. Um, and we have a significant um, uh, number of partnerships with Ivy Black Girl. Um, we've committed to multi-year funding for their doula access and pipeline programs, sponsoring annual community baby showers, and we're, uh, we've been invited to participate in their ne um, Nebraska Maternal Health Equity Task Force. This is really um, a, an important turning point where that we're experiencing in healthcare, where there's growing convergence and alignment in our regulatory accountabilities to identify our patients' health-related social needs, to gather more complete race, ethnicity, language data to help us identify healthcare disparities and uh, achieve healthcare equity. And so what I did here was just a crosswalk of several different regulatory accountabilities so you can see this convergence which uh, really bolsters our efforts. And then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't call out a couple of different um, things that we, we um, were involved in over the, over the last year. We've been proactive in helping um, patients redetermine their eligibility for Medicaid. We have advocated for North and South Omaha economic development funding. Um, we are participating in the Douglas County Health Department's culture of healing work, um, and we are improving the collection of uh, race, ethnicity, and language data, um, both with uh, staff training and patient-facing materials, 
um, and then we're benchmarking that data for quality improvement. So, that's a lot of information. Does anyone have any questions? Awesome presentation. Sounds like you guys are doing some amazing things. Um, about the equitable maternity care, can you kind of speak on the implicit bias training requirement that you guys have initiated? And like, is that an annual thing? And how does that work? We would like to get there. Um, at this time, we received some external funding, um, initially from the Pampers Foundation, to create, um, so, so we were able to access a certain number of slots of the um, March of Dimes Breaking Through Bias in Maternity Care training. So that's the training that we're using. Many of our staff uh, in the Omaha Metro and those, those verticals of labor and delivery and NICU were able to access the training um, that was a one-time training um, with those initial Pampers Foundation dollars. We are actively fundraising because we know through attrition, we have new staff that now have not completed that. So it's, a, it's an ongoing um, process, but it's not currently. Now all of our staff and healthcare, all of our clinical staff are required to complete trauma-informed care training, but it's not that specific maternity care equity uh, or implicit bias training um, that we think is a, an additional um, add-on that we want all of our staff to complete. And ideal state would be that it would be an annual requirement, but that's not the current state. We have to start somewhere. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your presentation. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Uh, the question got brought up uh, about do we have this room past 10? You know? I, I think, think we do. that we technically only have it till 10, but practically almost always are in here till 10 30. okay okay so if we if it's up to you if if you want to go past 10 we can do that or we can push off the last presentation until next month that's also uh i'm good either way i just wanted to make sure that he had enough time to get you know we, we have get through room. everything that he wanted are we good we're good he if heather says we're good we're good all right i trust heather Well, thank you. Um, tough act to follow, I will say. Um, I would also uh, just like to point out, I'm thank you so much for the resolution that you all passed uh, earlier in this meeting. It means an awful lot to all of us as public health professionals to see that prioritized. Um, I want to give a brief update on the Division of Health Equity and Planning. Um, and again, I'm Jamin Johnson, Division Chief of Health Equity and Planning. Um, over the past several months, as the department has continued to restructure, um, some of the functional uh, elements of the department have uh, shifted and, and kind of solidified under the Division of Health Equity and Planning. Obviously, the primary, my primary responsibility still remains um, making sure that we are embedding health equity and the principles of health equity in everything we do as a department and that we are partnering well with our friends throughout the community. Um, vital statistics, communications, performance management, quality improvement, accreditation, and workforce development are all areas that have been um, uh, transitioned under the Division of Health Equity and Planning so that we have a robust and dedicated staff capacity to address these things uh, as we move forward. And they are all um, really important um, Trojan horses of embedding health equity principles throughout our department and our community. Some of the things that I want to highlight um, that I know have been prioritized by this board um, are uh, giving you an update on the Legal Epidemiology Project. This is something that um, has been a important um, uh, ask and uh, project of the board. Um, and so I want you to know that it is moving forward. We have a um, community health planner um, that is uh, the full-time, 40-hour-a-week uh, dedicated staff capacity to make sure that this uh, funded project continues to move forward um, in partnership with Change Lab Solutions. Um, as you'll recall, this board gave some, um, some guidance and direction on some potential priority areas to focus on as we look at the impact of policy and public health policy, historical public health policy and the impact that that has on continued um, health outcomes within the community and the uh, 
the direction that uh, we have we have taken um, kind of in partnership with the guidance of this board, but also in listening to community voice is to focus initially on um, policies related to and connected to mental health and then policies connected to education. Um, and so our uh, team has been able to um, conduct uh, targeted focus groups um, with community partners um, looking at both mental health and education policy and the impact that those policies have had and continue to have on, um, on the overall communities that are reflected. Um, in addition, um, our staff has been able to partner with Change Lab Solutions to identify and build targeted educational um, opportunities for not only our staff, but for um, all of all of y'all on the board and anyone else um, that makes up our key community partners to be able to um, expand their knowledge and understanding of um, policy level work as it relates to um, the impacts of um, of disparity. Um, and so we have uh, identified and created three targeted trainings. And the first was a policy 101 for public health practitioners. That training um, was conducted last week with 25 participants. Um, I, I believe that it is definitely something that we can continue to, um, to reproduce quite effectively um, as the needs continue to rise. Uh, we will have two more trainings that are that build on this initial training, but uh, do not require that you have attended the initial training to be able to participate in the follow-on trainings. Um, really briefly, I want to let you know some of the work that the um, health, uh, health educator within the Division of Health Equity and Planning has been working on. Our health um, educator has been um, building strong relationships with the International Council for Refugees and Immigrants, or ICRI, and um, has been requested to provide targeted and specialized um, public health education to um, communities served by ICRI related to um, respiratory illness. This is a direct result of um, our partners in um, in infectious disease at the building out and standing up a robust uh, respiratory uh, illness dashboard um, that uh, that spurred questions within um, targeted uh, unique communities within our community within oh, Douglas County that wanted a little bit more information on how they can protect themselves from uh, these respiratory illnesses um, and how they can also uh, continue to educate their communities in languages um, that are their preferred language. So our health um, educator has been able to provide in-person um, education sessions to members of the Afghan, Nepali, and Congolese communities um, related to these respiratory illnesses, as well as provide um, COVID um, vaccination, not vaccination, I'm sorry, COVID testing demonstration for them, and then the distribution of COVID um, vaccine, uh, COVID test kits I keep, vaccines are on my mind. So it's important that we continue to get vaccinated. Um, but over the past two months, uh, they have been able to provide 696 at-home test kits to members of those um, communities at their, at those communities' requests. So um, another update, obviously the reason that I stand before you is because of the resolution declaring racism a public health crisis in 2020 that created the Office of Health Equity that became the Division of Health Equity. Um, it enshrined 22 tangible action steps um, into the resolution that targeted and focused the work of this division. Um, in the past, you've heard us talk about how we boiled these down into four strategic directions. Um, we felt like it was very important that we create a progress report to demonstrate to you and to the community that we are, in fact, taking action to move in those areas. Um, this has been a, um, a product that was created in partnership with the Board of Health's Health Equity Committee um, and the strong leadership of, um, of Board Member Weiss. Um, and so it is our intention to uh, first share this out to the entire subcommittee, uh, health equity subcommittee of the board, and then make sure that it is provided to each of you. And I would be happy to come back and give um, some targeted time to discuss what the uh, progress report uh, has identified and what our plans and directions are moving forward over the course of the next year. Um, I want to give a little bit of an update on some of the um, sections that have 
um, started to build out this division. Obviously, communications is critical. Um, it is something that we continue to identify as essential in being able to meet the needs of the communities we serve. Um, and I get the privilege of really just highlighting some of the things that have already been shared today in this meeting. Um, our deputy director spoke to the um, information line and the effectiveness of that as a resource for our department, but, but also as a resource for our community. Um, and I will acknowledge that there's some historical context that I'm still trying to, to, to gain on when, in fact, we started tracking the number of um, encounters that we have had. Um, but from the point in which we started tracking those unique encounters until the end of 2023, our information line has um, has made 72,000, uh, over 72,000 unique contacts with members of our community. This does include the outreach and the outbound calls that were um, that were conducted in support and of the public health responses to tuberculosis um, and rabies. So I want to acknowledge that this is. Uh, there's some proactive numbers of, of unique contacts that are reflected within this as well. Um, I also want to acknowledge that as we continue to um, strengthen and support our, our community relationships around communications, we're also expanding our opportunity to communicate in unique ways and explore new and unique communication channels. So that is important. And I know that we have mentioned many times the um, the creation of a, a dedicated supervisor position for our communication section. Um, this is still this is still a, a work in progress. The requisition is in with human resources to again re, uh, repost that position so that we can find um, the the right person to take on the leadership mantle of overseeing the communication section. Um, also, vital statistics uh, is a really important uh, component of our entire department, and they continue to partner throughout the department in making sure that the information that is uh, provided um, is accurate and that it is timely. Um, and so they have worked very closely with our um, epidemiology team in particular to make sure that they are able to um, stand up and support our, um, our dashboards and are working very closely with the health equity team to make sure that we can actually stand up and launch a health equity dashboard. Um, you've heard me talk about the key health indicators um, that I tend to look at that are a good snapshot in time to identify the, the uh, prevalence and the, the reality that disparity exists. We want to make sure that we can visualize that for the community so that uh, we can uh, make timely decisions, but also people understand what is informing our decisions. Whoa. Sorry. Um, the director mentioned accreditation, um, and I want to note that step four of the path to accreditation does involve celebrating the fact that we will be accredited. Um, that's a really important thing. But I wanted to give you a snapshot in time on where we sit as far as accreditation. Um, we do intend and plan to submit um, on the 29th of this month. So that is, I think, the end of next week. We plan to submit all of our documentation to the Public Health Accreditation Board. Um, the department as a whole is working feverishly to meet this goal. Um, this is an all hands task and would not be possible without every single person within the department contributing their knowledge and expertise. Um, and so this really is an opportunity for us to celebrate. I, I honestly just got goosebumps just thinking about it. Um, this is the farthest we have come as a department in being able to meet this goal and it is going to happen. So. Um, we are, I am tracking this, I am asking the accreditation coordinator to update this table for me several times a day to probably her annoyance, but that is, that is how close we are to meeting this goal. Um, and so I am excited to come back before this board in the coming months and let you know that we are, not, that we are waiting for that site visit as the next step. Um, I wanted to talk about briefly a few other areas where we have continued to work. Um, one of the things that we realized that I realized um, was that we have been um, 
we've been really good at um, convening community partners. We haven't necessarily um, done a fantastic job of then um, taking what we learn in those settings and doing qualitative analysis to really understand the themes that emerge in those settings and make sure that we are either using those um, to, uh, to improve or addressing those asks that are made. And then being intentional about communicating back to the communities that we serve, that we have heard, understand, and recognize what they're asking for. Um, so we are, we are using this as an opportunity to strengthen our, our capacity within the division to um, conduct qualitative analysis. Um, we are looking at the COVID um, uh, community advisory meetings that took place over a course of several years. Um, we have transcribed all of those recorded meetings, um, and then we have uh, begun um, we've begun boiling those down and, and identifying emerging themes so that we can uh, make sure that one, we can say whether or not we've addressed what was highlighted as an emerging theme, um, and then we can make sure that those themes are on the top of our mind as we move into other um, encounters and opportunities to engage with our community. In addition to that, we conducted an oral history project, which took um, several. It took several years, and it um, was an opportunity for us to not only capture the uh, the history of members of our workforce, but also key community partners. That's an opportunity where we we had, we made a really large ask of of our workforce and our community partners to share their story and experience. And then we really didn't do much with it after that. So we want to honor the, um, the commitment that people made in, in sharing their story. And we want to actually conduct um, an intentional um, qualitative analysis on what, uh, what was provided to us as the form of uh, really important and valuable insight and, um, and also an opportunity for us to glean um, knowledge from people's lived experiences. So we have um, begun that process. We have conducted our initial analysis of the community um, portion of our oral history um, oral history project. And so we have that um, compiled into a report and we are trying to do a similar task with the uh, staff side, the workforce side. Um, the surveys, the questions were conducted in a little bit different manner. So we can't, we can't seamlessly crosswalk the way in which we're doing this to create one, um, one product, but we do want to make sure that we are creating something that looks reflective and similar so that we can make sure that we are one, providing that back to the people who honored us with their experience and two, we can provide that to the community as a whole and use it to inform our future decision making. Um, I mentioned the health equity dashboard, um, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. And I've also spoken to you quite a bit about accreditation. I'm happy to do that anytime you want me to. There are a handful of us within the department who actually um, get pretty excited talking about it. And then there are a handful that are happy to let the rest of us do that talking. So anytime you'd like for um, more information on accreditation, I'm happy to do that. Um, so I, it's also my opportunity to speak to the importance of the community health needs assessment. We are in the, we are in the midst of the survey um, right now, and it is every person's opportunity to contribute um, to the survey um, and to encourage people around them to. Um, the Wellbeing Partners um, has done a masterful job of supporting um, and leading the outreach and communication around this. And I wanted to make sure that you um, were aware that we do have communication in both English and Spanish um, to um, inform and, and encourage participation broadly. Um, and I have uh, included the QR codes as well so that it makes it simple and easy for each of you to scan and take the survey too if you wish. Um, if you want, um, if you want print material, yes. ask a question about that. Absolutely. Uh, I was going to observe earlier that um, that is a very important point you just made about encouraging people to participate in this survey. I, I recall taking it three years ago and just took this one recently too. And it's a little bit different. It, it, to my recollection, the previous one was more about, well, what are your perceptions of the needs in the community and where do you think you see? This one's much more personal about what are you, what are you experiencing 
uh, I think in an effort to get to the point Ashley made about um, really making sure we're measuring what people are experiencing individually and, and then working on those particular issues. And so that much more important that we advertise this and get this out to everyone to take because it's going to influence the next three years of every system's community benefit activities, right? Absolutely, yes. And I will, I will say that, you know, the regional approach uh, is unique. I've, I've mentioned this before. It is not something you see um, as, as a national model, although it should be. Um, and that gives us a unique opportunity to partner with our hospital system partners, our academic institutions, and our neighboring health departments to be able to actually apply a regional approach to addressing identified health needs. Um, and this does, this current round um, does take a, um, a different approach than in pre previous years to really uh, look at individual need. Um, this is also the first year that there is a web-based opportunity for people to contribute and participate. And in addition to that, this is the first year that the survey, the phone survey is not just going to people with a landline, but it's also going uh, targeting cell phone, um, cell phones as well. So there are several, um, several unique changes to how it is being conducted this year that is hopefully going to expand people's access and ability to contribute and participate. And I want to acknowledge that it is a long survey, so it is, a, it is an ask. We are asking for people to, to contribute a, you know, a large percentage of their time, 20 to 25 minutes to complete it, and we understand that. Um, but the, the value um, that it adds to our community and being able to make informed decisions to support um, community identified need is so important. So we really do want to encourage people to participate. Jamin, how are, <clears throat> how are you getting this information out to vulnerable populations? And so to be able to take the survey and is there an age limit i mean can there, teenagers take it uh eight you have to be 18, 18. to take it um <clears throat> so uh so that i mean that is potentially a limiting factor and i will say that the the pediatric um community needs assessment is all survey is also out at this time and that also um it is targeting parents and caregivers but it's also um, you have to be 18 or older to contribute to that one as well. Um, but we are, uh, I, I hate to, to use the same words, but this is another all hands on deck activity. Um, all, of the, all of the members of the Regional Health Council are working diligently to, to use every opportunity they have to get the information out about this. I know that our community health workers and our field staff are um, are taking these flyers with them when they go to community events. We are sharing it um, as widely as we can through all of our communication channels. I believe that, um, that we uh, issued a press release yesterday, um, Monday and yesterday, and we made sure that that went out in both English and Spanish. And we, we are open and, and uh, willing to um, to meet any, any opportunity to continue to expand opportunity for people to contribute. I'll just add, um, and I'm sorry if you already said this and I just missed it, but this is the first year it's been available as an online survey. So in previous years, it's, it's been this phone survey. So we are truly hoping that we are able to um, have way better reach this year. You know, the fact that you can scan the QR code, go on and take the survey um, is hopefully helpful. Um, also recognizing that doesn't reach everybody. So we're, we are recommending and asking that people take these flyers and I mean wallpaper with them if you want. We would love for people to just know about it and take the survey so we can have a really great representative sample. So a follow up on that. <clears throat> In the survey then, will there be sufficient identifying demographics for the final analysis to um, give us a broader picture of the individuals in the community that responded? Uh, yes, yeah, so we've worked, we worked with a PRC to try and um, make sure that we are um, drilling down on those key demographic details. Um, I will say that we also are conducting 
an oversample um, of the phone version of the survey in um, the eastern part of um, of Omaha, so 72nd East, um, to try and to try and expand um, access and, and and uptake. And the hope is that we can um, we can make sure that we have strong demographic information, um, especially from the phone survey participants. Um, the uh, surveyors are. Uh, they are uniquely skilled in making sure that they can encourage full re full responses to the survey. So, and I I literally took this last night. <laughs> so, um, so I want to thank you guys for offering it online. It, it, the flexibility of being able to do it when I had twenty minutes was great, <laughs> um, rather than waiting on a phone call, etc. So, um, and yes, it was very comprehensive as far as the demographic information that it was asking. And I do want to acknowledge, I'm, I'm the person up here speaking about this right now, but this is, I mean, our entire department is committed to this. Um, Dr. Kasnave has, uh, her division and my division are in lockstep in um, trying to make sure that we get broad um, participation because it is so critical and crucial to our planning and the work that we do. We want to make sure that the work that we are doing is actually meeting identified need. Um, and so you will, you will probably not have an opportunity to interact with any of us over the next several weeks without one of us bringing this up. So, Would this be an opportunity for the community health workers that are working with y'all to make sure like any contact they have right now through May, they're asking them to do this or offering a computer to help them do this? Okay. Absolutely. Um, and this is just an overview of the timeline. One of the things that I want to acknowledge about this is at the exact same time as this survey is going out, all of the, um, all of the members of the Regional Health Council have also contributed a list of key, um, key stakeholders so that key informant interviews can be, um, can be conducted as well as a supplemental um, add-on to support um, our, you know, collection of robust information to help us make informed decisions. So those key informant interviews are scheduled to start in May and carry through the end of June. Um, that and that should help to augment some of the findings that come out of the actual survey. Um, and then I want to briefly talk about workforce development. Workforce development is um, prioritized in our public health infrastructure grant. And what we recognize is some of the areas where we want to focus our attention really are on making sure that we are standing up a strong um, onboarding program for our new employees. Um, and that is really helpful to make sure that people feel like they understand what their role is and what their place is within the organization. And then we want to support our existing employees in receiving recurrent ongoing training um, so that we are a we continue to be a high functioning um, organization and health department. So those are a few of the of the initial um, focuses of of our work as it relates to workforce development. Um, really recognizing that our um, you know the the skilled and, and talented workforce um, that that impacts the ability for us to meet the needs of, of our community in, in a responsive and, and productive way. So that was that was it in a nutshell. I am happy to come back to give a deeper dive in any area. Jamin, I just have <clears throat> one question. On the second slide, you identify 25 participants that were in that legal epidemiology initial course. Could you describe those participants? Were they health department or were they people from outside the health department? There, there were people from outside of the department um, that are embedded in uh, some of our community uh, partner organizations. The majority of the participants were, um, were internal staff within the health department. Um, and I, uh, off the top of my head, I apologize. I'm not entirely sure what the breakdown was, but I'm happy to get that for you. And is this part of, um, in terms of FAB accreditation, this three-part series in terms of offering 
that to the workforce? And so I, I will say that everything we are doing, we are making sure is connected to FAB accreditation. Um, this was not, this was not um, created or rolled out as a result of FAB accreditation. This was um, one of the identified um, like focus directions of the legal epi project. You know, one of the one of the goals um, outlined in that project was to build um, sustainable internal capacity to be able to do policy level work um, on our own. Um, and so we recognize that right now we have the opportunity to partner with a national uh, a national leader, but we may not have that opportunity forever. And we wanted to build our own capacity, and so we wanted to use the opportunity we had while we are partnering with this national organization to expand our own internal capacity. All right, thanks. Appreciate it, Jamie. Uh, there were two. Looks like there was two chat notes in there. I don't know if those were questions from earlier or? They're not, they're just a notification. Oh, okay. um, there's a function Morning. within uh, Zoom that lets you, basically will like send you a summary oh. afterwards. So oh, it's, okay. it was just that Nothing notification. Else. Okay. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Uh, all right, well, so the de other department reports had gone out. Were there any questions that anybody had on those? Seeing none. Um, so then there is a, the next Board of Health meeting will be Wednesday, April 17th. Uh, and then if uh, the committee meetings scheduled for the first Friday of the month, uh, next scheduled uh, meeting is April 5th. Uh, no need for an executive session this week. Uh, so then we'll, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Second. 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 All right. Uh. Wade? Yes. McNally? Yes. King? Festerson? Yes. Jones? Yes. Rogers? Espinoza? Wilkin? Yes. Weiss? Yes. 